Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you all again. Ah, it's such a joy to be back amongst you all. Pretty excited to get back into our study of the book of Revelation. We've been on this side trail, sort of. I think it's a very important thing to go down and explore, uh, looking at how blood is described and used in our scriptures. So I invite you to follow along this morning. We'll start in Psalm 79. So I tried finishing our talk on blood last week. I thought I was done, and I just couldn't pass up this psalm. So we're going to talk about this one this morning, recap, and get through, perhaps, Revelation 16. So as you're finding your way to Psalm 79, let's open in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for another day of grace. Thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, that paid for our sins, that gave us the way to heaven, that seals us by your Holy Spirit unto that day of the redemption of the purchased possession. I'm so thankful for this glorious gospel that we have today. I'm thankful that anyone, anywhere can receive this great gift of life simply by believing sincerely in who you are and what you've done through your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for shedding your blood and paying for our sins that we can believe that your blood was sufficient to cover it all. Uh, thank you for the study that we've gone through regarding blood in the scriptures and what it means and, and answering that why, perhaps, that we may not even known to have asked before. So I thank you for your holy word that it equips us. And uh, I pray, as always, that your spirit would guide us unto wisdom and understanding that we ought to have, encouraging us in a life we ought to live that uh, we may walk in all pleasing unto you. It's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen. <clears throat> Psalm 79 says this, O God, the heathen are come into thine inheritance. Thy holy temple have they defiled. They have laid Jerusalem on heaps. The dead bodies of thy servants have they given to be meat unto the fowls of the heaven, the flesh of thy saints unto the beasts of the earth. Their blood have they shed like water round about Jerusalem and there was none to bury them. We are become a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and derision to them that are round about us. How long, Lord, wilt thou be angry forever? Shall thy jealousy burn like fire? Pour out thy wrath upon the heathen that have not known thee, and upon the kingdoms that have not called upon thy name. For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his dwelling place. Oh, remember not against us former iniquities, let thy tender mercies be speedily prevent us, for we are brought very low. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of thy name, and deliver us and purge away our sins for thy name's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is their God? Let him be known among the heathen in our sight by the revenging of the blood of thy servants which is shed. Let the sighing of the prisoner come before thee, according to the greatness of thy power. Preserve thou those that are appointed to die, and render unto our neighbors sevenfold into their bosom their reproach, wherewith they have reproached thee, O Lord. So we thy people and sheep of thy pasture will give thee thanks forever. We will show forth thy praise to all generations. And I thought how apt this psalm was regarding Revelation 16 in particular, but for those that may not have heard, Israel was also attacked last night uh, by Iran. But I wasn't going to get into all those details today. How true the psalm is, especially that part about they have shed the blood of thy saints, in verse 3 there, like water round about Jerusalem. And that question again, how long? Reminded me of Revelation 6, I almost said Revelation 5. The fifth seal, that's why I was confusing the number. But Revelation chapter 6, the fifth seal, how long, Lord, holy and true, dost thou not avenge our blood? Right? So they're asking that same kind of question in regard to the tribulation period. So I thought that was one that was perfect to end our look at blood. So in recap, if you'd like to turn to Revelation 16, in recap about blood and its use in scripture and why when you get to revelation 16 when two of the vile judgments the v-i-a-l judgments or the bold judgments have to deal with <clears throat> turning the 
ocean waters into blood as well as the fresh waters into blood and how the angel of the waters says in whatever verse that is, <laughs> I got to find it. Verse 5, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged us. Now, it triggered me to ask the question, why is that right and just? That uh, the angel of the waters, you know, something again to consider that there is an angel of the waters, that uh, why is this just and right of, the blood, of turning these things to blood? Well, he answers that really in verse 6. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. <clears throat> so it is just and it is right for God to pay back on that generation uh, the blood that was shed of all the saints. And hopefully me, by, by me saying words, those words, it's triggering in your mind some of these passages that we've talked about concerning blood. It goes all the way back to Genesis 3, because our Lord Jesus Christ references uh, Abel's blood in Matthew 23, another passage that we had looked at. You don't have to turn there. I'll try to briefly recap these things. In Genesis 3, uh, God makes coats of skins for Adam and Eve, so that was the first blood sacrifice. Skins come from an animal, so blood must have been shed. Uh, Adam and Eve had sinned in willfully disobeying God, eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, <clears throat> which God said in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So they willfully did that. God shed blood to cover that and gives the first messianic prophecy there in Genesis 3.15. But then right away in Genesis 4, when we read about Cain and Abel, Abel brings a blood sacrifice to the Lord, and Cain does not. Cain brings up the fruit of the ground. And Cain gets all upset about this, resulting in him killing his brother. And when God himself, and really think about that too, this is pre-incarnate Christ, in other words, talked with Cain directly and says that the blood of his brother cries out. And remember, I asked the question, why would the blood cry out? And so as we looked at blood throughout Scripture, Genesis 9, after the flood, there was a law given that uh, now that the flood is done and God had at that time wiped out the Nephilim, and a whole other subject to get into because there were giants in those days, pre-flood and also after that. So they came back. But uh, now after the flood, things have changed. God said, you, I've given all living things into your hand to eat. You can eat any animal, any, anything, basically. Well, probably not rocks, but you get the idea. Animals will now be afraid of man. They're, it's not going to be easy for man to get the flesh of animals, but God very distinctly said, you will not eat the blood. By the hand of man will I require it, by the hand of every beast and every man, however that's worded there, uh, God says he will require it. So there is no, no, no place for presumptuous murder. There's no uh, place for eating the blood. God says in that passage that the life is in the blood, and you just don't do that. Then we get further on information in Leviticus 17 when God says again that the life is in the blood and that God gave the blood on the altar to make atonement for the souls. Blood makes atonement for the souls, so it was life for life. It was our understanding of that. We looked at how God said in Numbers 35, blood defiles the land and can only be cleansed by those that shed it. And we were introduced to the kinsman redeemer or the avenger of blood and the cities of refuge. So we took a little time exploring that. <clears throat> uh, Deuteronomy 19 talks more of the cities that were appointed for the cities of refuge. A little bit more information on that. The cities were designated in Joshua 20. And uh, we just under, we took that understanding and linked that to Revelation 16 under, uh, and God taking on that avenger of blood, right? In what we just read in Psalm 79, how long do you not revenge our blood? And uh, God says, again, it is written that vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord, right? So there's all these scriptures that point to what God is going to do to make everything right and just when everything is said and done. Uh, and that, that, you know, one of the reasons why I thought it was so pertinent to go on this sort of side trail. It's a side trail, but it's also the, the main path. You know, it's, it's very important, I think, to understand all of this. We look, 
It's the road signs. Yeah, yeah, road signs along the trail. There you go. We looked at Jeremiah 51 with a pretty distinct reference to Revelation 18 in there, how this, this judgment was upon Babylon in particular, but also talked about vengeance being taken, and that prophecy was, was tied to a stone and cast into the river. I could be wrong about that, some body of water. But then we looked at Revelation 18, Revelation, singular, 18, in verse 21, where a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. So there's this immediate fulfillment in you know, the kingdom of Babylon at that time, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom passed down to Belshazzar. Uh, but anyway, all of that being revenged upon with Media Persia. But there's also that futuristic look to future Babylon, the great city, which we will talk about more in detail when we get to chapter 17 and 18 in Revelation. So we, we took the time to look at that. Then the passage I mentioned at the beginning this morning, Matthew chapter 23, where Jesus, that's the whoa, whoa, whoa chapter. And at, toward the end of that, he said that all the righteous blood from Abel unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you slew between the altar and, or something like that, uh, will come on this generation, not all, this generation. And so we asked ourselves, what does he mean by this generation? Because there's a lot of talk out there in the world. Does it mean 40 years? Does it mean uh, 70 years? Does it mean 80 years? And that those all have some scriptural reference. But when we're talking about all these things shall come on this generation, and he's considering the blood from Abel to Zechariah, we can't imagine. That's just a 40-year span, right? Or even a 70 or 80-year span. He's actually talking about all those that are unrighteous, whether they were the irredeemable uh, Nephilim or uh, humans that just willfully rejected God's way of salvation. They just rejected God entirely. So all of that will come upon that generation, and you see it being poured out, Revelation 16, and ultimately being poured out in Revelation 20, the great white throne judgment. A lot to take in there. Uh, it, when we were looking at Matthew 23, I couldn't help but go to John 8, when in John 8, uh, Jesus points out, you are of your father, the devil, when he's talking to the Jews that were contending with him. Uh, John I want to say it's like six through, well, even further than eight. But it's just this discourse between J uh, Jesus and unbelieving Jews, and they're trying to reason like with physical means or something like that, and Jesus keeps coming back to a spiritual reality. Right? So you see this, this contention of worldly wisdom and spiritual wisdom, and how Jesus just boils it down to those same two groups. You are of your father the devil. My father is God. Abraham's father was you know, God. He's essentially putting the, them in these two buckets where you could fit, uh, which I, I actually reverse those from what I normally do. I always put Adam on the left hand and, and Jesus on the right. But you get the idea, right? It's, it's, you're either in Christ, I did it again, whatever, in Christ or in Adam. You're right, my left this time. <laughs> or you're of God or you're of Satan. I mean, either way, it's just the two... two positions to be in spiritually. Yeah. There is no fence to sit on. Absolutely. There is no fence. There is no gray area. Uh, I know a long time ago, I, there was somebody who wrote a comic about that. It was like a two-cell comic or something like that. And uh, Jesus comes along, and there's a bunch of people in a field, and there's a fence in the middle. And you got one, people on one side on the other, and there's a few on the fence. And so Jesus comes along, says, okay, everybody that's with me, let's go. And like people on one half just go with him. Satan comes along, says, everybody with me, let's go. And the other half on the other side go with him. And then Satan comes back, he's like, hey, I said for you to come with me. And he's pointing to the people on the fence. And they're like, well, we never made a choice. It's like, it doesn't matter. I own the fence. <laughs> right? So there is, no, there is no middle ground. And that was the point of that comic which honestly, I've looked for it. I can't find it anymore. <clears throat> so if anyone's artistic, you want to remake that, go ahead. But you're right. There is no gray area. If there is an indecision, that means it, God was rejected. So if Satan owns the fence. Right. So I, I think that was a pretty good visual. Uh, so J Jesus points out, you are of your father the devil, because if you were the children of Abraham, you would listen to me. 
The words that Jesus was speaking, they were spirit, they were truth, and they would not hear it. They would not listen. <clears throat> so then, of course, we had to talk about Matthew 27 and Acts 5 when uh, Jesus was crucified and the people actually said, let his blood be on us and upon our children. One of the most foolish things anyone could have ever said. And then later in John, I'm sorry, in Acts chapter 5, when they tried to defend themselves. It's like you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Right, you can almost kind of see that I don't know what to call it, uh, childish, defensive, well, I didn't do anything wrong. Uh, yeah, you did. <laughs> you know, it's, we've all been caught up. We can all kind of relate to something like that. Then I couldn't help but talk about, I wanted to just talk about Hebrews 9.22, I believe it is, but I couldn't do that justice without going to at least back to Hebrews 9.1 and mostly through chapter 10. And I honestly saved us a couple of chapters because once I get going on Hebrews, I just want to go in Hebrews. It's fascinating how it, it takes all the Old Testament stuff and points to all the New Testament and how much better that is. And all those things in the Old were a shadow of things to come. And it's, yeah, it's directed to the Hebrews. This was given to you, Israel. This is your identity, the man that lives or that does these, does these things. Good English there. <laughs> does these things shall live in them. Uh, like it says, I think it's Leviticus 18, 5, 6, something like that. Uh, but that, that's what Paul writes about, too, the righteousness which of the law is, is this, Romans 10. Okay, so it, it, you got that kind of difference there. And the writer of Hebrews, which I don't want to get into that discussion, my goodness, there's so many people that argue about who wrote Hebrews. I don't care. God didn't say. So just leave it at that. All right, it's the word of God. That's what matters. Let's focus on that. Anyway, that's my own little frustration. But uh, the writer of Hebrews takes him from all that Old Testament stuff, says, look how much better this is in the New Testament that Christ paid for sins once for all, uh, and he is the propitiation. So they're talking about the same uh, propitiation that we preach to, right? That his blood paid for the sin of the world. It is the propitiation, the payment in full. And there is no more work that needs to be done. But I had to go over that because uh, people point to the book of Hebrews trying to convince others that you can lose your salvation. Because the way it's worded there can look like, yeah, you can lose your salvation. But uh, my argument to that was, it's very similar to Colossians 1.23, where it says, if ye continue grounded and settled. It's, it's this concept of, here's the gospel, now what are you going to do with it? You've heard the light of the gospel, and I'll use myself. I was living in darkness. I know that. I was living in darkness. I was okay with that, right? We, we'd watch our movies or play our video games or have our hobbies, and we kind of forget about, I'm living in this darkness. It's that escapism kind of mentality. It's just what the world does, what the flesh does. So I was living in darkness, but somebody came along and shared the light of the gospel and illuminated the things that was going on around me. Now in that moment, I had a choice. I could be like, yeah, this isn't good where I am. I want that. Right? I, want to be, uh, I want to be illuminated. And there's so many analogies I could make here. Spiritual wisdom and understanding versus worldly wisdom and understanding. But in that moment of faith, or the moment of time, I had that choice. I heard the gospel, it illumined everything around me, it showed the difference of dark and light. Go back to Genesis 1, let there be light, right? Or 2 Corinthians 4, how the God of this world has blinded those, lest the light of the gospel should hope shine unto them. Thank you for helping me finish that one. I know some verses, I just don't know them in their entirety. Uh, but anyway, uh, I had that choice. So now, if I continue grounded and settled into that truth, I'm saved. If I choose to, yeah, not for me, guess what? I'm not saved. I heard the gospel, but there was no fruit there because it was not mixed with faith, right? And that's something else that scripture says. So Hebrews doesn't talk about losing salvation, but that brings up another point of <laughs> book of life type stuff because the name being blotted out, right? Uh, and that sort of thing. So all these things, I think, now, because they were burdens on my heart to go over, even though I was not honestly confident in preaching about it or talking about it, but I just, I can't ignore these things. And I want to put them on the table because I know I'm not the only one with questions. Uh, so that concept, which I kind of dug my hole and I'll have to, to get my way out a little bit, with being blotted out of, Israel, uh, out of the book of life, like all Israel is not Israel. Kind of messed up that. But Romans 9, they are not all Israel, which are of Israel, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. You know, and what he's trying to get at is those that 
heard and understand the gospel, and it was mixed by faith. So uh, God is dealing with national Israel, but the thing with national Israel is they're not all in Christ. There are unbelievers and there are believers in Israel even today. However, in the body of Christ, you only have believers. That's the only, those are the only residents in the body of Christ. I don't know where I was going with that. But there, I just want to help us understand the difference. God made certain promises with national Israel, whether they believed or not. Okay, he made certain promises with them, uh, like in time past, they were under the law, but God still worked to and through Israel to show himself to the entire world. And you know, with them being blotted out of this book of life, like they're all in there to begin with, but should they choose to reject God, reject his way of salvation, reject Messiah, then their name would be blotted out. Okay, so I guess that's really what I was trying to get into with that without going down that rabbit trail this morning, because I do want to get back into Revelation 16. Uh, but we talked about all those things in the book of Hebrews, so I wanted to bring that up, and I'll talk more about the book of life. I want to try and finish book of life stuff also today. A lot of trying to wrap up the loose ends and tie them together a little bit today. Uh, so all of that uh, going to say that in Hebrews, we see that judgment hangs on the children of disobedience. Even in the book of John that was written, John chapter 3, where most of us are very familiar with John 3.16. We could probably quote that all off the cuff. Uh, but it's very important, even the verse before that and the couple ones after. Let's actually turn there. I know I said go to Revelation 16. Put a marker there. We'll be right back. Uh, if you turn to John 3... And let's begin in verse 15. John chapter 3 and verse 15 says, I know it's the middle of a sentence, but it says that whosoever believeth in him, the Christ, should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. So I think those verses are very important to see, rather than just verse 16. But he does talk about that dichotomy again, and it's very simple. Believe or do not believe. Be saved or don't be saved. It's, it's that dichotomy that we see throughout Scripture. And that understanding of light versus dark, I've had a lot of that uh, this last week. Light versus dark, Genesis 1, let there be light, and there was light. And he divided the darkness from the light. And I brought up the other verse in uh, 2 Corinthians 4, lest the light of, of the gospel should shine unto them. Right? So when we see that, yep, our deeds are evil because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because of the gospel of God, then we have in that moment an opportunity to change our course of eternity. It only takes one time, a one time of sincere belief, and it doesn't matter what we do thereafter, although Satan will try to confuse us. We are in a spiritual battle, and that's just going to happen. And I was talking with the kids this morning, too. One of the, one that, there are so many important verses to memorize, but one of them that I think we all need to really take to heart is Romans 8, 37 to 39. Okay, where we cannot be separated from the love of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is written, I cannot lose my salvation. Period. And if God says that, it won't happen. Yeah, go ahead. Have you ever done a study? Because I've heard, but I've never looked and checked into it as far as the Greek or the Hebrew or different word, you know, word in the little word that let there be light. And then the word light from the sun and the moon in the Hebrew, they're two different words. Hmm. I haven't looked at that, but I'd be interested to look at it now. <laughs> you know, they're two different 
words as far as the light of the Lord, and I am the light of the world, compared to like just the light that you turn on. Okay. Well, that's interesting. We'll take a look at let there be light, and that light is different than the sunlight, or other, what we would call natural lights. I'll have to check that out. Thanks for bringing that up. I heard it a long time ago, but I never really... A lot of people look at the Greek and they, they have books through the high heaven. I just lay Greek. <laughs> yeah. I confess I'm one of those linguistic nerds, even though you might not guess it listening to me, how I stumble over them and make up new words as I go. Uh, but yeah, I do like to look at the original languages and, and find like root meanings. It's, it's fascinating to me. So with that being your 30-minute recap, anyone have any thoughts or other comments to share? Because the rest of Revelation, we probably can, or 16. The entire book, no way. But the rest of 16, we can probably finish today. It's very straightforward. Okay. Good. Well, I hope that was a jolly jaunt through Scripture. Now let's turn to Revelation 16 and pick it up in verse 8. I've got to be poetic every now and again. <laughs> Revelation 16, 8. We're on the fourth V-I-A-L judgment. It says, The fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power, exousia, authoritative power, was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power, exousia, authoritative power, over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. And very straightforward. The only question I toyed with in my head was, uh, in verse 8, when it says power was given unto him, it could very well also have been translated power was given unto it to scorch men with fire. So just an interesting thought. Is it the angel behind it? Did God allow the sun to scorch men with heat? Uh, what doesn't matter? <laughs> we know the end result, right? <laughs> that the, all of a sudden now the sun, which had a third of it smitten, so don't forget that, in the trumpet judgments, a third of it was smitten so that the third of the day and the third of the night shone not, whatever that looks like. Now, for us, it's almost unfathomable. We get the idea, yeah, did the 24-hour day become a 16-hour day? Like, it's really confusing, uh, but again, it plays into no man knows the day or the hour. I don't know how anyone's going to tell time during the tribulation period. And now the sun is so powerful, it's actually burning people up. And instead of them saying, yup, this is the wrath of the Lamb, let's change our attitudes and follow after Him, it's the same attitude back in, Genesis, in Revelation chapter 6 when they say the wrath of the Lamb has come, and who can... Doesn't your memory get better when you get older? <clears throat> the wrath of the is come, and who shall be able to stand? Why couldn't I think of those words? Who shall be able to stand? And of course, right after that, we get the 144,000 who will be able to stand throughout the tribulation period. But now, it's that same attitude of let the rocks fall on us. Let's just try and hide. Can anyone hide from God? I mean, the scriptures are very clear on that. The Lord doesn't see. Remember those verses? There's a whole bunch of them, actually. Yeah, he does. <laughs> right? God sees all of that. He sees into our hearts. He knows the thoughts of every man. He knows the hairs on our head, right? based on the scriptures that we might be familiar with. So anyway, this is the, the, the mentality or the attitude of unregenerate man. Right? This is uh, the ones that have taken the mark and also, by the way, because there will be a group that have taken the mark. There will be a group of those that have not taken the mark and yet do not believe, they'll just be slaughtered. And there is going to be a group that have not taken the mark and do believe, and of them there will be that remnant supernaturally protected. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm just trying to paint the picture of what life is sort of like during the tribulation period. You'll have different, dare I say, political groups going through uh, the tribulation period. The difference is uh, they don't care if you're Democrat or Republican. They care if you're, you got the mark or you don't. Okay, it's, it's very much different, very different from what we have today. Uh, and also, as we get into the next chapter, there will be zero religions tolerated. Zero. They'll all be done away with. Uh, worship the beast or die. That's basically what it's going to be. 
Now that we've got that pretty picture in our head, let's move on. Uh, Revelation 16.10 <clears throat> says, The fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. Same thing going on. God offers, or God pours out this other plague, which probably reminds us of the plague in Egypt, which was a darkness that could be felt. And we could go back there and uh, look at that again. Exodus 10, that's where you'll find it. Exodus 10, verses 21 to 23. I wasn't going to go there this morning because uh, I think it's pretty straightforward. This supernatural darkness. But what's interesting to me is this fifth angel pours out this bowl, the vial, upon the seat of the beast. And that takes me back to Revelation 2, where to the letter to the church of Pergamos, it says to them, in Revelation 2, verse 12, to the angel of the church in Pergamos, write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges, I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. So in my mind, that's where this bold judgment is being poured out. I had joked before about this could be a summer home, and he really wants his throne in Jerusalem in the temple. You know, something like that. Uh, but wherever he ends up pouring this out, which I do think it's, you know, why would God mention it here if not for that point? Uh, because he, he reiterates it twice in Revelation 2.13, where Satan's seat is, You hold fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. And he says it again. This is where Satan dwells, where he lives. Uh, so, regardless, anyway, both times, if you're interested, is the Greek term thronos, which I'll let you guess what English term we get from that. Uh, but it, both times, that's what the word seat is. The result is more important. His kingdom was full of darkness. His kingdom was full of darkness. So who is that going to be? It's going to be all the unbelievers, everyone with a mark. Okay? They are going to be in darkness and gnaw uh, their tongues for pain. And I think back to the Exodus account, how in Goshen, in Israel, there was light and they could see. But for Egypt, they were bumbling around in the dark. They couldn't see their hands in front of their face. And I think a very similar thing is going to be happening here in the tribulation period, because it's his kingdom. And I also had the thought of uh, Colossians 1, where we were in the kingdom of darkness under Satan's authority. But when we trusted the gospel of Christ, we were translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Now we're under, or we're in Christ, rather. We're in Jesus' kingdom under his authority and that sort of thing. So I, again, I think that natural, or that remnant, rather, is going to be supernaturally protected through this. Okay. So they blasphemed the God for their pains and their swords, sores and did not repent of those sores coming from the first bowl judgment. Verse 12, now we get some, some fun stuff. It says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, and that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Tensions mounting. Can you feel it? We're coming to the end. But uh, there's a lot of talk, discussion about this particular passage. I'm going to try to keep it high level, but I'll welcome some conversation about it. In verse 12, so the vial is being poured out on the Euphrates to dry up the river uh, so that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. I should have given a picture. I have pictures, so maybe I'll have to do this next week. Just to show the river Euphrates, it's not a small river. It's quite large, and it makes sense when we see it how this is making the way of the kings of the east. I have some statistics here. It would be better if I brought the visual, but I didn't, so shame on me. But it flows for 1,740 miles. Somebody measured it. I don't know why, how, but they, they measured it. It's a very long river from its source in eastern Turkey to the Persian Gulf. So if you can kind of mentally picture the Middle East in your head, uh, that's where the river Euphrates goes, modern-day eastern Turkey, down into the Persian Gulf. Babylon and the location of the Tower of Babel was located along that river. It's in the land of Shinar. It's in Babylon. <clears throat> okay, so that's something to consider as well. 
And this way, it's going to allow a vast army from the east to come in to Jerusalem. That's the whole point of this. Three spirits come out, as we see in verse 13. I saw three unclean spirits. Okay? And they come out of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. We know who these are based on scripture. Revelation 12, the dragon, very clearly, that's who we know as Satan himself. The beast is going to be Satan incarnate, or the son of perdition, uh, the unholy son of the unholy God, if you will. And then the false prophet is mentioned in Revelation 13 as well. He is that other beast that comes up out of the land with the two horns that spake as a dragon, looked like a lamb. And he is that unholy spirit. So you've got this unholy trinity here, and the spirits are coming out of their mouths, and they look in appearance like a frog. Now I've, had, I've heard a couple different messages and sermons comparing frogs versus the dove, comparing the Holy Spirit versus these spirits. Interesting. Uh, I didn't get a lot out of it, so I wasn't going to regurgitate any of that this morning. Uh, just kind of an interesting thought about all that. But what I do want to point out is this is another case of Revelation 119. John sees the things that uh, he, he has recorded, what, the, what he has seen, and he's going to tell us what they are. Okay, that's what I'm getting at here. So he sees unclean spirits like frogs, and in verse 14 it says, they are the spirits of demons. Okay, I'm going to retranslate that one because that's the Greek term daimon, daimonion, that's how you say it, daimonon, but that's demons. These are the unclean spirits, the same ones that Jesus was casting out during his earthly ministry, the same ones that uh, the sons of Sceva tried casting out unsuccessfully in Revelation, <laughs> Acts 19, not Revelation 19, very much different context going on there. Uh, so that's what they are. It's Yeah, I don't want to go down that trail. That's what they are. They are the unclean spirits, and their job, they've got a job, but look at what they're doing. They're working miracles. They're doing these signs and wonders and things wherever they go. And maybe we won't finish. Uh, in, turn with me to Matthew 24. There's, there's too many pertinent things to go over. And uh, I'm excited to get to the end, and that's just me because you've got someone who went to school for rocket science and you got these giant hailstones. So I had to go through the math and share with you about kinetic and potential energy and good stuff like that, but <laughs> I'll just give you the high level when we get there. It's just, I, I had to ask those questions. That's where my brain goes. What if that kind of, or what, what are the results of that? Anyway, Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse. Uh, I want to point out both this one and Luke 21. So just a couple verses in, in Luke 21 if you want to find your way over there. Uh, Matthew 24, verse, I don't know. All of it. Let's try 24 to begin with. We might go almost to the end of the chapter, though. Uh, Jesus says, for there shall arise, and, and again, the context here is in verse 3. In verse 3, the disciples ask him privately, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming in the end of the world? And he gives them this whole discourse about here's what's going on at the time of the end. So in verse 24, Jesus says, there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he's in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. Made me think of the trumpet judgment, smiting a third of the moon and of the sun. It says the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers the dunamis powers, or the abilities to perform power, of the heavens shall be shaken. Totally makes me want to read Isaiah 24. Okay, for those that may not be familiar, that's when he's going to punish the high ones which are on high and the kings on the earth. So God is going to do away with the unclean or the disobedient spirits as well as the disobedient children of men. See, lots of stuff that are pertinent. So we, we're going to have to do another week in Revelation 16. Sorry. 
Just got to do it. Uh, let's look at verse 30. It says, Then shall appear the Son of Man of heaven, in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Because they didn't want that. They tried rejecting it. They tried hiding it. They tried using that tactic of escapism. Let's just uh, go you know, have the rocks fall on us because the wrath of the Lamb is here. It, it, and they're not putting things that matter at the forefront of their minds. And there's so many lessons I think I could preach about that. How about any of us could preach about that? You know, what are we doing in the day-to-day -day that really matters on the scope of eternity? Don't have to answer that question, but just think about it. It's one I challenge myself often. Uh, so anyway, the Son of Man is going to appear. It's going to be as the lightning shines from the east to the west. It shall be very, very obvious. We're talking Revelation 19 here. It says, They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power, his own dunamis, dynamite power, and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one heaven, end of heaven to the other. And you think about that time frame, he's talking about the believing remnant. Specifically, he's dealing with Israel, so all of them. Right, so the ones that survived the tribulation period, the supernaturally protected remnant, he's going to send them out for the four corners of the world and gather them together. Where? The promised land. Right? And this, this plays into Ezekiel 40 through 48. They'll have their specific allotment of land, and, and that's where they're going to live and reign and rule for a thousand years as the kingdom of priests. Right? And we just got to let the scripture say what it says and, and, and trust that. And honestly, that's so awesome. I can hardly wait to take, I'll say take part in it, but I'm thinking of you know, the eternal scope here. I'm probably occupying my spot in heaven. I am 99.9% .9 convinced of that. <laughs> uh, although others will say all believers that are in Christ are going to come back with him in Revelation 19 and nobody will get touched on the earth and all that. Fine. I don't want to argue these points to cause di division amongst brethren because we agree that uh, Jesus Christ paid for our sins on the cross of Calvary. And honestly, when you get to the end game, who cares? We're all in paradise, right? We're with our Creator God. We're celebrating in a new body and all of that. Uh, but I will show by Scripture, I'm pretty convinced that's for Israel, and that we will join them later on in the new heavens and new earth. But we'll all be together. You know, it's not like we'll be apart. God's not going to create this infinite barrier between Israel and everybody else. Right? I have full confidence that every single believer in Christ will have fellowship with each other in the new heavens, new earth. Okay? So we'll get there. I side trail too much. Where did I leave? He shall, okay, verse 32, learn a parable which is the fig tree when his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when you see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, and here's that term again, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. What are you talking about there? 40 years, 60, 70 years, 80 years? That one. This age, uh, you know, that, that of, of allowing the lowercase g God of this world to be the prince, the power of the air. Because once he does all this, right, uh, this generation shall not pass to these things be fulfilled. Once he uh, allows that, Satan's going to get bound for that thousand years. And then we're done with that stuff. He's going to put an end to sins. Remember what Daniel 9.24 was all about. Uh, these 70 years determined upon Israel and upon Jerusalem. And one of those things was to make an end of sins and to anoint the most holy. And so he's going to do all of those things, and none of his words are going to fall to the ground. It's all going to come to pass. So I'm not too worried about um, 1948 and 1988. All right, 88 reasons why Jesus is going to return, 1988, and 89 reasons why it's going to have, be in 89. <clears throat> anyway, uh, or uh, what is it, 2018? Yeah, that came and went. 2028? Right? That'd be 80 years. I'm not worried about the time frame there. God knows his timeline, and I'm just going to do what God wants me to do until he calls me home. Right? It, that's not to say don't pay attention to the world. Pay attention to the world. But uh, it, it's not to, to... Don't even... Don't set dates. Just say it could be today. Now, and somebody joked about that, too. He's like, I'm not going to set a date, so I'm going to set all of them. It's today, and if not today, it's tomorrow. If not tomorrow, it's the next day. And he just went on and on and on. It's very silly, but yeah, live like that. Redeem the time, for the days are evil. We don't know if this is the last day I will draw breath. I, I keep being told I'm young. I, I haven't felt young for a while because I've had my digestive problems, but hopefully they're getting better. I don't know. I feel like I keep going through layers and getting slightly better, slightly better. But I'm constantly reminded I'm not in my forever body yet. <laughs> and I think all of us go through something like that. 
uh, but still, I, I want, it's because of that that makes me so zealous to make today, what if today was the last day on this earth? I want to make sure I do the most I can today. What can I do to share the gospel now? That's, those thoughts are at the forefront of my mind because of this infirmity. And if, all, if any of you have an infirmity of any kind, which I think that's everybody, use that for that same motivation. Right? Isn't that exactly what Paul says, follow me as I follow after Christ? And what was his attitude? That I become all things to all men that by all means I might save some. I keep my body in subjection. Right? 1 Corinthians 9 is a very motivational, inspiring passage. So there's your little bit of preaching this morning. I didn't cover everything I wanted to cover. We're already a little over time. Uh, let's just try and hit a couple highlights here. Uh, verse 36, the day of the hour, no man knoweth, not the angels of heaven, but my father. Right? And he talks about the days in the, of Noah. Nobody saw it coming because they just went through their day-to-day -day anyway. How much like that is it today? People go through their day-to-day. -day. Oh, I've got to go to work. I've got to go get my morning coffee. I've got to go do this and that and the other thing. Right? We have all these earthly things that take over our attitudes and our minds uh, but even in those, I encourage us believers to share the gospel in that. You're going to get a cup of coffee? Give them a track. Say, God bless you. Even those three words could change their eternity. Like, oh, God, you really care about God even at coffee time? Yeah, why not? I mean, when the opportunity really presents itself, give the gospel. You know, like I shared a little while ago with our, the, the survey that I took at our, my day job. Now, what motivates you? Hmm, okay, here we go. You know, you're going to let me do all this? Uh, it was a free text field, and there was no end in sight for that? Okay, here you go. I'm giving you the gospel. And so that was that. I mean, when that opportunity, go for it. When someone uh, like the Walmart and Shawano <laughs> said, oh, I'm probably going to hell for that, wouldn't you rather go to heaven? I mean, when someone says stuff like that, and you're right there, go for it. Right? And if some, uh, you're not to put me down or anything, but I am quite introverted. I don't like striking up conversation. But if someone opens up that door of opportunity, I want to go through it. And so I want to encourage us to do that while it is yet today, uh, before we're called up and out of here. So um, just to give the attitude again, right before Jesus comes back, like he's talking about, they're still going to try to go through their day-to-day. -day. So even with all the supernatural judgments and stuff going on in the tribulation period, they're still going to try to go to their day jobs. They're still going to try and clean the house, you know, have guests come over for dinner, stuff like that. They're going to do what they're going to do. But then he's saying, all of a sudden it's going to be here, and he's going to describe himself as the thief in the night. As Christ is that thief in the night. If the goodman of the house had known in what watch they would come, he would have watched and would not suffer his house to be broken into. But they're not going to pay attention, and here he comes. So there's plenty more, I think, that we could talk, with, talk about in that regard. And there's no way, I'll just keep talking and talking, and we will have no break. So I think I'm going to have to just stop myself. Uh, we'll pick it up next week in verses 12 to 14 again, and uh, tie up a few more loose ends with the Olivet Discourse. I know I told you to put a mark in Luke 21. I didn't get there. We'll get there next week. <sighs> Let's pray. Lord in heaven, thank you for another day to study your word. I thank you for the sweet fellowship of the saints. I thank you for your holy word. I'm so grateful for your Holy Spirit that unites all of us in one body, the body of Christ. I'm so thankful for that Holy Spirit sealing us onto the day of redemption of the purchased possession. I'm thankful for that hope that you've given us, a for sure, certain hope that nothing can ever take away from us. I pray we embrace it. I pray we take all these things to heart, knowing that your justice will be poured out one day and all will be made well and someday we'll all get to live with you forever. And with that in mind, let us live each day as it could be that day you call us home, that we may uh, keep our bodies in subjection and do all things for your glory. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.